Okay, hi folks, my name is Matt Thomas and thank you for tuning in to the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. This meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized with contributions from Stephen Slaughter and Jamie Kostelnik. For those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. We're gonna wait until the end of today's presentation to take questions. So in the meantime, uh, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted and your camera is off when you're not intending to speak. So uh, Katie, with that, thank you so much for introducing today's speaker. Yeah, so um, I'm Katie Barnhart here in Golden, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker who I originally met through um, HEU um, box and poster sessions. Um, so um, Ari, John Levinger is a PhD candidate in civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Policy from Chapman University, and then worked as a staff scientist at the Los Angeles-based nonprofit, the Council for Watershed Health, for two years before starting graduate school at UC Irvine. And it was at the Council for Watershed Health where she became interested in urban flooding, post-fire debris flows, and the potential for nature-based infrastructure to address urban floods under climate change. I think you will all enjoy um, seeing this work and learning what um, she's been uh, researching. So with that, uh, please take it away. Thank you much, so much, Katie. Um, I'm so grateful that you invited me to speak today. Uh, a lot of my work is kind of built on the USGS landslide hazards work on post-fire debris flows, so I'm very excited to share with you the work that I'm doing right now. So I'm going to turn off my video just for um, a saving bandwidth for my presentation. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, as Katie mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at University of California, Irvine. And uh, this work covers uh, most of my dissertation research. I should be finishing up this summer, which is very exciting. Um, and my dissertation is all about how to model uh, post-fire flood hazards considering infrastructure sedimentation. And this photo we're looking at is a type of flood control infrastructure called a debris basin. Um, it's designed to capture sediment coming off uh, the mountain canyons during storms, and it's kind of a focal point of my talk today. So we'll start with the presentation outline. Uh, the first part of my talk will be providing some regional context for post-fire flood hazards and uh, the, conceptual, uh, the conceptual framework that we use to develop our model of these hazards. The second part of the talk will be describing how the stochastic modeling framework works and uh, specifically how we model uh, things like wildfire, storms, and infrastructure um, and their interconnected impacts on flooding. Part three will be describing some of the ongoing work that I'm doing to calibrate and parameterize the model using um, readily available, publicly available data for uh, watersheds in Southern California. And the final part will be a demonstration of how we use the model to simulate both present and future post-fire flood hazards, um, taking to, into account sequences of storms and how they can clog uh, flood control infrastructure. So we'll start off with some context. And this photo is of a flood control channel um, in Riverside County that has some, uh, you know, debris and sediment that eroded during a post-fire storm after um, the Holy Fire in 2018. So as many of you may already know, California experiences a fire flood cycle in which periods of drought lead to the right climatic conditions for wildfire, and then uh, storm events following the fire can cause flooding and debris flows, especially since the uh, fire makes the landscape more susceptible to erosion. And um, with all that rainfall, eventually the vegetation will regrow and become fuel for future fires. So post-fire debris flows uh, involve high velocity flows um, that are very erosive. Um, Especially, well, those in Southern California that develop in steep catchments can be very destructive. So 
Here's a photo of debris flows from the Montecito um, events that unfortunately took 23 lives. And, um, you know, with the higher proportions of sediment, the flows can carry um, boulders and cars and um, result in uh, major losses of life and property. So there are many uh, trends that point to post-fire flood and debris flow risk increasing. One of them is the increasing frequency of large wildfires. So uh, this is a list of the top 10 uh, largest wildfires in California state history, and you'll notice that seven of them have happened in the last five years. So fires are becoming more frequent and severe, and also people are moving into harm's way. So uh, approximately one third of uh, houses in the U.S. are now in the wildland urban interface, which is the transition zone between developed and undeveloped lands. And so these trends point to the fact that flood risk managers need better tools for estimating post-fire flood and debris flow risks in order to make informed decisions about emergency planning and future flood risk infrastructure design and maintenance. So we are, um, we are aware of previous modeling, which uh, is focused on predictive models of post-fire peak flows and erosion. Um, uh, extensive work has been done on um, modeling post-fire runoff and erosion. For example, uh, the USGS post-fire debris flow hazard models. And these empirical models estimate the likelihood and of debris flows at the catchment scale. Um, and I'm aware by talking to um, flood control agencies that this data is widely used um, operationally throughout the US West. Uh, uh, so that said, these models don't consider the role of flood control infrastructure in the development of the flood hazard. And many communities in the southwestern US, for example, in California and New Mexico and Arizona, are uh, protected from floods by flood management infrastructure. Um, so that begs the question, how do we model the downstream flood impacts um, while taking into account the effect of this flood control infrastructure? And these are some debris flow um, estimates for the Holy Fire in 2018 in Riverside County. So to give you an idea of the impact that if infrastructure has on post-fire flood hazard, these are uh, photos um, of post-fire infrastructure clogging. So culverts um, that convey flows under roads can get almost completely blocked by sediment. And in Riverside County, what's interesting is there are a lot of unlined flood channels, which, um, which essentially allows high velocity flows to erode um, the banks. And then, uh, you know, a lot of properties are built right next to the channel. And so um, the clogging of these channels uh, results in flooding. And if we don't take into account, you know, how are the how is the infrastructure sized? How is the infrastructure maintained? Um, we can't uh, accurately estimate the flood impacts on downstream communities. So now I'll explain um, the conceptual framework behind our model. Um, so this diagram shows a mountain catchment, a mountain catchment right here. And the way that these flood control, or I'll call them the flood management infrastructure systems are set up is there's a debris basin um, located at the foot of the mountains that's designed to capture uh, woody debris and, um, uh, you know, boulders and coarse sediment and only allow a clear stream flow to enter this downstream flood control channel, um, which then conveys the flows safely past the community to a downstream water body. And um, these types of infrastructure are designed for a, a specific design level. Um, so as long as a storm is not greater than that design level, the infrastructure will work uh, as expected. But when a fire occurs, um, as I'm sure many of you know, it removes vegetation that serves that serves to stabilize the soil. And depending on the severity of the fire, um, uh, the there could be the formation of a hydrophobic layer on the soil, which reduces 
uh, run, uh, sorry, reduces infiltration of rainwater into the soil and it increases runoff. And so um, as a result, we have increased runoff and erosion potential after fires, which means that when storms happen after the fire, they fill the debris basin with sediment and debris. And if multiple storms happen in sequence and uh, the flood control agencies are not able to clean out the debris basin between those storms, uh, the debris basin can overflow, allowing a mixture of sediment and water to enter the channel. And we call that mixture bulked flow. So the channel is not designed to handle um, coarse sediment and it can, the sediment can settle out and reduce the capacity of the flood channel. Also large debris can block the channel or block culverts um, or bridges and cause flooding in this downstream lowland area. Another type of flood uh, impact we want to point out is that because this urban lowland area is much flatter than the upstream um, steeper topography because it's flat, the water can spread out far away from the flood channel and cause flooding in areas where people might not be expecting it. So to give you an idea of where this type of flooding might happen in Riverside County, I've made this map which shows um, the warm colors are burn frequency since the 1800s using um, fire perimeters from CAL FIRE. And so the warm colors are burn frequency. The cool colors are flood estimates from FEMA. So you can kind of identify where those um, overlap. And this hatched red area is the wild and urban interface where a lot of the fire impacts happen. Um, and then you can kind of visualize uh, where the downstream impacts might be by looking at these gray urban areas and the green areas are debris basins and dams. So Riverside County uh, is an excellent um, kind of example or test bed for this model. Um, and recently there have been, recently there have been um, large wildfires um, upstream of communities. So here in the peninsula ranges, you have the Holy Fire that I've been mentioning in 2018. Um, and there were observed debris flows and hyperconcentrated flows in this Lake Elsinore community. And then more recently in 2020, the El Dorado and Apple fires uh, burned in the San Bernardino Mountains. And um, there were some massive debris flows just this past winter there. Uh, so Riverside County represents an excellent location for studying these types of hazards. And we're working with Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District to um, get information and insight on how infrastructure is impacting the flood hazard. So I'll quickly show a video, a drone video. Let's see if it'll work. Uh, I'll quickly show a drone video of, yes. Uh, this is a debris basin downstream of a canyon completely burned by the Holy Fire. And as you can see, the debris basin is overflowing. Um, the water is entering a, an unlined channel, so uh, the, the stream bed can erode. And what's interesting about this floodway is that there are homes right uh, next to the floodway. This canyon hasn't burned for 40 years, uh, so people are relatively unprepared for um, this level of post-fire flooding. And then I'll speed up a little bit. Let's see. And this drone imagery is provided by Riverside County. Let's see. Okay. I just wanted to speed up, but the controls are not letting me, so I'll just wait until the video ends. Um, so you'll notice that as we get closer to the road, uh, the flow goes into a culvert underneath. And you'll see in a second that the flows come out very quickly um, from the other end of the culvert. And those fast moving flows eroded the bank and um, resulted in the collapse of that roof. So uh, yeah, these impacts are definitely 
very um, salient for the community. And then this video shows um, debris flows from the El Dorado burn scar. Maybe some of you have seen this before. Uh, this video is incredible to me. So the channel here is clearly undersized for an event of this magnitude. And um, you can see over in the right, that's a steakhouse that essentially got completely inundated um, and sustained massive damage. Uh, and now you can see the flows are transitioning to a more water dominated type. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, these are the types of flows that we're trying to study and how they interact with the flood infrastructure systems. OK, so now I'll dive into a description of how the modeling framework works. And essentially, I wanted to um, discuss our approach to modeling sediment laden flows. So in order to model post fire uh, flows, we need to take into account the continuum of flow behavior um, between water flow and debris flow. Uh, so th there's a continuum of sediment concentration and particle size distribution. Um, so on one side of that continuum, you have water flow, which has relatively low po uh, proportions of sediment, and the fluid behavior is dominated by the viscous fluid forces. On the other side of the spectrum, um, in this case, we're considering up to debris flows. Uh, sediment concentrations can be more than half of the volume, and the fluid solid interactions within the flow become more important. So, with our model, um, our approach is to simplify the contribution of sediment to the total flow rate using something we call the bulking factor. So the bulking factor K is the ratio of the total flow, so the water discharge plus the sediment discharge over the water discharge. And um, using the bulking factor, you can see the table on the upper right, we're able to um, capture the spectrum of different types of sediment laden flow that we're interested in. And um, in our model, we use the bulking factor to represent the impact of wildfire on erosion or on the hydrology of the watershed. So um, before the fire, we set the bulking factor to a pre-fire level, in this case one, and when a fire occurs, it increases. Um, essentially, you can define a range that it increases to, and then it decreases exponentially uh, with time back to the baseline level. Uh, so the advantage of using this bulking factor is that it's already used uh, regionally to design flood control infrastructure. And um, we don't want to overcomplicate our model um, more than is justified by our data. Um, sediment concentration data is notoriously hard to find, especially after wildfires. And so um, our approach is to use this bulking factor um, to quantify uncertainty. So you can specify a range of um, potential likely bulking factors. And then we can essentially quantify uncertainty by um, running multiple simulation trials with different values of bulking factors in that range instead of specifying one bulking factor value. Um, so that is our approach. And here I have an overview of the model, um, uh, the model components. So to model the hydrologic impact of wildfire, we have a fire occurrence um, model that essentially simulates fire as a random variable. Um, so uh, the fire occurrence model uses the uh, uses Monte Carlo methods. Um, based on a user specified fire frequency. So say we want to um, have a fire return interval of five years. What we do is we calculate the probability of fire occurrence um, that corresponds to that. And then uh, we use Monte Carlo sampling to determine or to implement um, that frequency of fires uh, in the simulated time series. 
And then we also have a wildfire severity model, which is uh, based on values of the post-fire bulking factor. So essentially, uh, we assume that greater burn severities are related to greater values of the bulking factor. And you can define bulking factor ranges for different uh, burn severities. So that covers the wildfire models. Then we model rainfall using a Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain rainfall simulator, which is it's calibrated to a long term data set of uh, daily precipitation for uh, at a uh, rain gauge station in uh, Los Angeles. And um, I should mention that the model runs on a daily time scale. So um, yeah, we're using a daily rainfall time series to calibrate that. Then the way that we uh, resolve infrastructure, so we have infrastructure design and maintenance models. The design model uh, sizes the infrastructure um, based on a frequency analysis of long-term precipitation records. So um, in practice, uh, flood control agencies size their uh, infrastructure based on either long-term precipitation or long-term uh, runoff records. And so uh, we generate a synthetic time series of rainfall using this rainfall simulator, and then we um, do a frequency analysis to size the infrastructure accordingly. And uh, we use design standards uh, that are currently used in Southern California. Um, and then the maintenance models are coded based on maintenance pro protocols that are currently used by Riverside County. So we had these discussions with Riverside County Flood Control and um, we turned those into if then statements. Uh, so for a certain conditions, if it's after a fire, remove the uh, all of the sediment from the debris basin and the channel, um, things like that. And then we enforce those maintenance protocols. So finally, we calculate floods as the uh, amount of bulked flows greater than the channel capacity. And again, bulked flows, we um, refer to that as the mixture of uh, water flows and sediment flows. So that's kind of in a nutshell how the model works. And it's, uh, I definitely want to call attention to the fact that um, Riverside County co-developed the model with us by providing both important data and also feedback on how the model works and how it can be useful um, to their needs. So I just want to provide a model illustration um, where I'm going to illustrate how precipitation and wildfire interact and also how the model can um, produce different results for different management approaches for the infrastructure. So we're comparing three different management scenarios. The low protection management scenario, um, which is represented by the orange time series, that uses a smaller infrastructure capacity and less frequent maintenance. Uh, the high protection scenario uses the largest infrastructure capacity and the most frequent maintenance, and the moderate is somewhere in the middle. So in order to explain these results, first I'd like to focus on year 20. So this is a 100 year time series of daily precipitation. In year 20, we see some of the highest um, storms on record, but there is no fire happening at the same time as these storms occur. So uh, these horizontal lines represent the channel capacity. The channel capacity is not decreased very much. And in fact, we only see um, overbank flows or floods in the low protection scenario. Now, if we compare that to the floods in year 10, in year 10, we have relatively low um, precipitation amounts, but there is a pretty severe fire that's happening at the same time. So if we look at the channel capacities, they are decreased um, during that year. And you can see the corresponding overbank flows. There are overbank flows in all three scenarios. Um, and the last thing, you can compare the effect of different maintenance approaches by looking at the number of years with channel exceedances. So scenario one, there are nine channel exceedances. Scenario two, which is moderate protection, there are five. And scenario three, high protection, there's only three exceedances.
So this just illustrates how the model is able to capture all of those different influences inter that are interacting to produce the flood risk. So now that I've gone through um, how the model works, I am going to briefly share some uh, ways that we're using data from real systems to calibrate this model. So currently we have data from three different watersheds in Riverside County. Um, all three were burned by the Holy Fire. One is gauged, meaning that there's a USGS stream gauge at the outlet, and we have data on post-fire stream flow. And the other two are ungaged, um, but whereas the gauged uh, watershed does not have any downstream flood infrastructure, both of the ungaged watersheds have downstream infra infrastructure. So what we are planning on doing is calibrating our model to the watershed that has storm flow data, stream flow data, sorry. And then we're going to apply that calibrated model to the ungaged watersheds to simulate um, overtopping events, post-fire overtopping events. And we, we have a few observations from Riverside County uh, of actual overtopping events for the debris basin and the channel. So in that way, we can validate whether the model produces reasonable results. And we chose these systems because they have similar vegetation types, soil properties, and percent area burned. And so these are essentially this, the systems we're using to calibrate the model. So now we'll briefly look at a model parameter that we are estimating um, to calibrate the model. This T sub R term is the recovery time scale. And if you recall, we um, assume that the post-fire bulking factor decreases exponentially with time. So this K naught is the pre-fire bulking factor and the K sub one is the post-fire bulking factor. So what we're calibrating is the rate at which um, the bulking factor decreases back to normal. And so, um, we are essentially saying that the rate of watershed vegetation recovery should be commensurate with the rate that the post-fire bulking factor um, decreases back to normal. And so to estimate the watershed uh, vegetation recovery rate, we use time series of satellite-derived vegetation indices, so NDVI and EVI, and NDVI is commonly used for determining post-fire watershed um, recovery times. And we retrieve this satellite data from Google Earth Engine and we average the values um, over the watershed area and we have a time series. So then we fit an exponential curve to the post-fire vegetation indices in order to estimate the recovery rate. Oh, and that's following a paper um, that does the same thing, but for water burned watersheds in Portugal. And so what we're looking at is um, the top panel is normalized vegetation index, and this red dotted line is when the holy fire occurred. So I fit an exponential curve to the post-fire vegetation indices, and you can see the RMSC and R squared associated with that curve fit. And then this the panel beneath shows the corresponding bulking factor time series um, using that uh, estimated recovery rate. Um, so you can see how the bulking factor decreases at the same rate as the vegetation, the watershed average vegetation increases. So that is the method we came up with to estimate the bulking factor um, recovery time scale. Um, another set of parameters that we need to calibrate with real data um, is the range of the post-fire bulking factor. So, um, right, so the range of the post-fire bulking factor. So, again, we simulate the bulking factor as a, a random variable. So, actually, I should clarify this. We're, we're calibrating the range of K sub 1, which is um, the value of the bulking factor is immediately after fire. And here we've 
uh, develop methods based on a HEC HMS tutorial from the Army Corps of Engineers, um, where we are essentially, um, and, and they, they develop this for post-fire um, watersheds in New Mexico, where essentially we create a, water, a lumped watershed model in the hydraulic modeling software HEC HMS, um, and we adjust some parameters to represent the post-fire condition. So I'm just including all the different models that I use here, but essentially um, previous work has calibrated this uh, curve number, uh, which kind of represents the proportion of precipitation that becomes um, runoff. And they adjust it using um, the method of Livingston et al. They adjust the pre-fire curve number and lag time to reflect a post-fire condition. So we use those methods and we also use, um, in HEC HMS, you can use the LA debris method as an erosion model. There are other erosion models too, um, but we decided to use this because that's what the uh, Army Corps of Engineers used. Um, but essentially HEC HMS can, um, HEC HMS can help you estimate both post-fire flows and post-fire sediment volumes. So we run our HEC HMS simulation for the post-fire, um, for each post-fire storm, and we calculate the, the or we estimate the, uh, sorry, the post-fire bulking factor um, as the volume of water plus the volume of sediment divided by the water volume of water for each storm. And uh, the bounds of our bulking factor range for our simulation, they are set to the minimum and maximum estimated bulking factor. So I know that was a lot of talking, but I'll show you a graph that will hopefully make it more clear. So um, each of these plots is uh, a graph of the estimated volume of water in blue and the estimated volume of sediment in orange um, for each simulation interval. And so uh, this number represents the bulking factor estimate. And so um, what we do is we we simulate a low um, lower bound by uh, setting the fire factor, which is a parameter of the erosion model. The fire factor setting it to 3.15, which is essentially like uh, 10 or more years after fire. So that's our lower end of the bulking factor range. And then um, we also run a simulation for the higher fire factor, which is um, represents immediately after a fire. And so that's how we get the high end of our post-fire bulking factor. And again, we have a range to quantify the uncertainty in these bulking factor estimates because they're not directly um, estimated from data. It's a simulation. Hopefully I described that um, clearly. And uh, essentially that is how we use real data to calibrate the model. So finally, I'm going to talk about a recent paper um, in which we demonstrated how the modeling framework can be used to um, simulate both present and future hazards, uh, considering the effects of climate change on wildfire frequency. So um, the research questions that we looked at were, how does the frequency of channel exceedances vary based on current design standards and current maintenance approaches? And how will the frequency of flood channel exceedances change in the future based on increasing fire frequency and severity, um, considering the effects of climate change? So we tested four major types of simulations, uh, sorry, four major scenarios, but Today, I'm just going to talk about two of them. I'm going to talk about how we compare different infrastructure design standards across um, several different fire intervals, and also how those how, how flood hazards um, vary between design standards based on increasing burn severity. Um, so I should note that the model was configured based on a hypothetical watershed typical of Southern California. So um, we did this work before uh, we developed the calibration methods. So this is not for a real watershed, but one that has sort of average values for a typical Southern California watershed. And 
Um, the design standards to focus on are 50B and 100B, which represent those used in LA County and Ventura County respectively. Um, the fire interval, so to represent current fire frequencies, we use fire intervals from 10 to 50 years. And for um, more frequent fire intervals uh, that represent future scenarios, we use uh, a two year and a five year fire interval. Um, so uh, that's based on um, a map of fire historical fire frequencies in California. And uh, okay, and then finally for our burn severity categories, we tested um, low burn severity, moderate burn severity, and high burn severity, which each of those categories correspond to normal stream flow, hyperconcentrated flow, and debris flow by changing the range of bulking factors that we sample from when we simulate the flood hazards. Okay, so what I'm showing you now is the distribution or multiple distributions of flood return period. Um, so on average, how long of a period is before another flood happens. And from left to right, we are increasing in fire frequency. And on the x-axis, we compare the four different design standards for infrastructure. So the major takeaway is that as fire, in, as fire frequency increases, the median flood return period decreases across all design standards. Um, and uh, it's useful to interpret these results in terms of um, what we would expect if we were to predict floods based on precipitation alone, which is the marginal hazard, versus um, a combination of precipitation and fire, which we call the compound hazard. So uh, the amplification factor is the, is the return period of the um, precipitation flood re return period alone versus uh, divided by the um, uh, return period estimated by the model. So looking at the results in terms of the amplification factor, we see that even with present um, day risks uh, for a 10 year fire interval, the amplification factor is greater than one um, for our current design standards. And again, it's because uh, we're looking at it this way because a lot of our infrastructure, flood infrastructure is based on um, flood frequency analysis from rain data alone. And if we now look at future risks, um, considering increased fire frequency, we see that the amplification factor um, now varies from 4.5 to 11. So essentially we see up to an order of magnitude increase in the frequency of floods when we take into account um, the contribution of wildfire and also the contribution of infrastructure clogging. So now looking at the flood return period distributions with increasing burn severity, we see that as burn severity increases, median flood return period decreases as you go from left to right. And um, one key result to note here um, is that as you move from fires that in general uh, represent moderate burn severity to fires that have high burn severity, you see a two to three fold increase um, in flood frequency for current design standards, current design standards. So um, essentially, if fires in general were to uh, go from moderate burn severity to high burn severity, uh, according to the model, we would expect a two to three fold um, increase in flood frequency compared to um, hazards in the absence of fire. Okay, so the key conclusions from this uh, work are that uh, our estimate of present post fire flood hazards based on current infrastructure designs indicates that um, they are amplified by a factor of one to six relative to flood hazards in the absence of fire. And future post fire flood, flood hazards could be up to an order of magnitude greater 
than floods in the absence of fire based on potential increases in wildfire frequency and severity. And again, we're taking into account current design and maintenance um, approaches. So to sum up, um, our compound hazard modeling framework uh, is designed to support emergency preparedness, infrastructure design and maintenance decisions, and flood risk communication efforts. Um, and let's see, yes. Okay. Right. So our next steps for the model are to validate the model with observations of overtopping that we have for um, infrastructure downstream of the Holy Fire. So that will um, help us evaluate the model performance. And then once we've validated the model, we plan on uh, simulating a regional distribution of hazards or sorry, a spatial distribution of post fire flood risk for watersheds across Riverside County. And the watersheds shown in green are ones we have already identified as um, potential watersheds that would be suitable for applying the model to. And so uh, the ultimate goal is to identify hotspots in post fire flood risk um, and help uh, stakeholders understand areas that are most at risk even before fires happen. So to summarize, our original stochastic modeling framework is able to resolve the effect of interconnected um, drivers uh, of post fire flood risk, including wildfire, storms and infrastructure. This model is able to um, be calibrated with readily available data, such as uh, remote sensing data, gauge data, um, graded precipitation data, et cetera, uh, under, uh, to estimate a, the spatial distribution of hazards under both present and future scenarios, and future scenarios could involve climate change or could involve um, different management uh, scenarios for the infrastructure. And finally, we co-developed this model with um, Riverside County uh, Flood Control and Water Conservation District to inform both short and long-term emergency planning efforts and uh, improvements in flood risk communication. So we have some NSF funding to um, survey residents in risk risk prone areas to assess their um, risk awareness and to understand how like how we can improve risk communication. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much um, for listening and I welcome any questions. There's my contact info.